into it. Uh, the name of this, as you saw, was Wild and Furry, a romp through the world of Colorado mammals. And it's a, a romp because we are going to try to, we're going to cover, at least show some pictures of many, many of the 100 uh, and uh, 10 or 100 and, uh, well, 114, I believe, is the latest count of mammals in Virginia. Uh, let's make that Colorado. <laughs> and um, there won't be time to cover them all in any detail, of course. Even if we just wanted to do the rodents, uh, that's 58 different species in Colorado alone. So uh, we're going to uh, really hurry through some of the species and then spend some time on maybe some species that you didn't even know existed or don't know that much about. And on the flip side of that, I won't go too much into some of the more famous uh, mammals like the bighorn sheep and bison and so forth, because you can and probably have learned a little bit about them through other programs. So we're going to have one short break for questions uh, that can be both through chat and uh, voice a little later in the program. But as we go through, if you want to register a, a question via chat, uh, please do that at any time. And we'll try to keep current with your questions. And uh, also, we're going to try to uh, save the chat here so that if we don't get to all questions, we can uh, let you know via email later on. We're going to have an emphasis on Colorado, hence the title, but we'll definitely uh, view them through a lens of Boulder County, since that's where we're living and experiencing for the most part here. And uh, there's quite a number of uh, Colorado's mammals that live in Boulder County, so we'll be able to really get a good window into the whole state. But we'll also, every once in a while, take a look uh, at the world or national uh, level because there's some really uh, interesting ways to understand the mammals that are here by seeing where else they occur and um, their uh, taxonomy in particular, how they fit in together. So first we're gonna start off with a very quick uh, review of just what makes a mammal a mammal, the basics. Then as we go through here, we're gonna have an overview of many species as I mentioned through taxonomy, the way that we classify different uh, mammals. And it won't be at a very scholarly level, but I think it is helpful to uh, get into just a little bit of the terminology of classification so that you can understand the relationships between some of these animals. And then some closer looks at some of the selected ones. And then finally, every once in a while, some special connections to and lessons from our mammalian kin. And um, we are, of course, related. We're mammals. And here's two of my favorite mammals that are uh, climbing in their native habitat up at Settlers Park. These are my kids. And uh, so uh, what, we, what we learn when we study mammals is often a great reflection upon ourselves. So let's get started with some basics. What makes a mammal a mammal? Well, of course, you probably know all mammals have hair. And no other animals do have hair. So that's a diagnostic characteristic of a mammal. And even mammals like the echidna and the whale have uh, hairs. Uh, the echidnas are modified into spines, and whales are just little bristles here and there. And then, of course, some animals have great amounts of hair, <laughs> like us. Um, then all mammals produce milk for their young, and there are no other animals that produce milk for their young. So even the ancient platypus is classified as a mammal because it has hair and produces milk for their young. Then another thing that all mammals do is they uh, thermoregulate. They regulate their body temperature through their physiology, not just behavior like uh, other many other animals do. And rhetorically, I'll ask you, uh, do you know what other animals regulate their temperature through their physiology? What other animals do we call warm-blooded? Well, they are the birds. And isn't it amazing to think of uh, these tiny little creatures surviving uh, winter around here? Well, mammals, uh, there are body temperatures in the range of about 96 to 103.5 is about the highest mammal temperature. But birds usually run from about 105 to 110. So uh, they are 
uh, really ramped up in their metabolism, even compared to us mammals. Then, um, of course, as we go along, we'll see a lot of diversity in these mammals and what they look like, but there's, their bodies are diverse yet similar. So you can see that even though the horse's skeleton and the lion skeleton are, are very different, there's also some uh, marked similarities. And you can sh see the shoulder blade and the leg bones there and uh, how their feet are um, composed, et cetera, are both similar and diverse. And this often shows up, especially in the skulls. You can see here with the, the horse, the lion, and the bat. And we'll take a look at a couple skulls as we go along. And in fact, start with our first mammal of Colorado by looking at the skull. Um, <clears throat> this creature has more teeth than any other North American mammal. There's, there's 52 teeth in there. <laughs> And uh, I don't know if you've uh, ever heard which animal has the most teeth, but this is the possum. Yeah, and the possum is, of course, uh, our only marsupial. It also has some of the largest litter sizes, although that starts off with these tiny little babies uh, being born that then make their way to the, um, the sack, the mother sack, to uh, grow further, but not, not all of them survive. And it's a omnivorous creature that eats both animal and plant materials. Very, very um, adaptable. Well, in Colorado, which you can see placed on here, um, possums are moving west from points further east. And like a lot of birds, that's because there's been towns and cities built across the Great Plains. And they've moved west through and with those towns. And there have been a couple sightings of opossums in Boulder County, even though it doesn't show there. But uh, for the most part, possums are far to our east in Colorado. Well, when you think of marsupials, you often think of Australia, of course, and there's 220 plus species of marsupials in Australia. And in South America, there's about 120. And in the United States, or in all of North America for that matter, we have one, just the North American possum. But it's really interesting to point out that in South America, of those 120 plus species of marsupials, 110 plus of them are possums. And they include ones like this elegant fat-tailed mouse opossum. Isn't that a beauty, both in name and looks. So there's our first and uh, one of our most ancient um, orders of animals. And I use the term order. Uh, marsupials is the common name for the order Didelphimorphia. And the order is the level of classification just below class. So we have class mammalia. And then below that, we have these various orders that we'll look at today. And on some of these, we'll also look at uh, some other levels, but they're all under the kingdom animalia, the phylum chordata, which is chordates, uh, vertebrates, and then mammals under that. So uh, we'll start it, we start off with the order Didelphimorphia. The next one we'll go to is the insectivores, and they used to be called insectivora, but now they're called Eulipotifla. And uh, uh, there's been reclassification, as you can imagine, with the discovery of uh, DNA sequences, we've been able to really nail down the specifics of what is related to what in what way. But it's also quite amazing that a lot of the classification hasn't changed. And that's because the early scientists starting from long, long ago, the 1700s, were uh, observing all things very, very carefully and putting them into the different groups, different taxa, uh, by studying their morphology, their, their um, metabolism, everything, to try to uh, tease out their relationships. Well, the first family, uh, the most important one in Colorado by far, of the insectivores is the shrews, family Sericidae. And uh, here's one of our common shrews called the masked shrew. And uh, you can see that it's located in these darkened counties in 
in Colorado. And right in the center north part of the state, you'll see a little rectangular county, um, just where you see a little uh, kind of a black and white dot right near the middle north, that's Boulder County. So watch for it on future maps. <clears throat> Now the mass shrew, you can see on this national map, uh, is over much of the northern half of North America. And there's two little fingers that stick down into the mountainous and other uh, suitable habitat for this animal. And you can see that we're in one of those fingers. So even though it doesn't occur all over Colorado, its range is part of a much, much larger um, range. Now here's uh, the skull and the jaw of the mass shrew. And you can see these tiny little teeth that are just wonderful for both catching and holding on to insects and then chewing through the often uh, hard body parts of an insect. Uh, they might also uh, eat worms and spiders and other things like that, but uh, insects are definitely a big item of prey. Now here's the leash shrew. You can tell it, it's really, really tiny, right? <laughs> And it is a little bit of a joke here, but when we expand it to the size of your screen, you probably see it just a little bit over actual size. And it is a very tiny animal. And because they're so small and their metabolism is so high, many shrews have to eat as much as two times their body weight to stay alive. Every day, that is. Two times their body weight every single day. You can see the range map up above shows you where we fit in with the rest of the country. The Eastern Mole, but um, there's uh, not very many out here in Colorado. They're only on the very Eastern side of our state. But look at the adaptations of the mole, those huge front feet for burrowing through the ground. And you'll notice it essentially doesn't have any eyes and it really doesn't have any ability to see anything other than uh, light and dark. And you can see these eastern counties are the only place where the eastern mole uh, resides in Colorado. Well, then we go on to bats. And the bats are a very large order of mammals. And here in, in uh, Boulder County, we have 12 species of bats. And there's 18 in all of Colorado. So we're a fairly big hotspot for bats uh, in Colorado. The common bats are the, are the most common bats. There's another family we'll see near the end of this. And in here we have uh, creatures like the Townsend's big-eared bat. And if you notice on the map there, Boulder County, again, on the middle north end of the state, uh, is part of the range of the Townsend's big-eared bat. Uh, the little brown bat is by far the most widespread and most common bat across the United States. And we do also have them here in uh, uh, Boulder County in Colorado. And um, they, like all these uh, bats that we have in our state, are insect eaters like the insectivores. But you can see on this uh, picture the, the bones of the hand forming the uh, end of the wing. And that's why they call it chiroptera, which literally means uh, hand wing. Here's one that you probably haven't heard of, but they're not uncommon and uh, they're a fairly large bat and they, they live in Boulder as well, the silver haired bat. And sometimes I just like to say the uh, genus and species name, Lassionicterus noctivagans. Uh, sometimes uh, the scientific names can be kind of fun. <laughs> then there's the uh, free tailed bats, which are in a different uh, family, and you can see their tail does stick out beyond the end of the membrane of the tail. And these are largely a, um, a southern um, bat, but they do migrate and end up in Colorado during the, during the summer. And they're the ones that are famously under the bridge in Austin. So if you go to Austin, Texas, uh, during the summer, you can see, uh, I think over a million, don't, don't quote me on the number here, but a huge number of bats that come out from underneath a bridge uh, over a river in, in Austin, Texas. This one is not a free-tailed bat, you can see, and it's not in Boulder County, but I didn't want to pass it up because it is found in Colorado, and it's just a remarkable looking bat. It's a beautiful little thing. Uh, spotted bat has these black spots on a white body, these enormous ears, and you can see it lives in the western part of our state and up and down the western United States. 
Okay, now we'll move on to lagomorphs. And uh, what might lagomorphs be? <laughs> they are the rabbits and hares. And um, we're going to first look, uh, or they include rabbits and hares, and we're going to look at this family called Laporidae, the rabbits and hares. And the most familiar ones, of course, are the cottontail rabbits. But it's really interesting to note that in our area, uh, depending on where you are around the foothills region and out into the plains a little bit, you might see one, two, or all three species of cottontails found in Colorado. So the eastern cottontail is found in our uh, homes, home areas or cities a lot. But then if you live up against the mountains more towards Boulder and into Boulder, you could easily see a mountain cottontail. And even experts have a hard time telling these apart sometimes, but you can see they do have kind of uh, furrier, uh, stubbier ears. And then out towards the plains, say from Lafayette area on, you can see the desert cottontail. And they are a little bit skinnier, longer ears, slightly redder color than the mountain cottontail. But again, there's a lot of overlap in these characteristics. But three species right in our area. Then there's the snowshoe hare. And I wonder how many folks have, have seen snowshoe hares when you've been up in the mountains. They're not easy to see. But if you go up when it's uh, a snowy, um, during the winter and you're out in snowshoes or skis, you might see their tracks everywhere, left by these enormous hind feet and their front feet. And during the winter, they're even harder to see because they turn all white and you can hardly see them at all. And here's some snowshoe hare tracks through the snow right next to human snowshoe tracks. Um, I'm going to pause here just a little bit um, to see, Ben, are you still with us? Yes. OK. Um, are there any um, questions that have come into the chat? Uh, I don't see any, Martin. Okay. I don't believe so. Yeah, and actually last time we kind of uh, got revved up as we went along, but it's a good reminder to folks here too, just to uh, feel free to uh, put in a question if you like. Yeah. Well, here if we so, are at if the- someone likes to, sorry, Martin, if someone oh, yeah. would like to uh, enter a chat, just do so at any time and I'll check the chat box and see if anything's come up. Yeah, great. And you can interrupt me every, every so often. So uh, here's another one of the Laporidae and the black uh, tailed jackrabbit is a, um, a species found out on the Eastern Plains. And I left off the top of this um, uh, picture on purpose because I wanted you to really be amazed by those ears. Look at, they look like antenna. But as is the case in, in many uh, mammal species, ears are often cooling devices, not just for hearing, but during the summer to pump blood through the ears and to let the body heat dissipate through the ears is a great adaptation for hot environments. You can think of the elephant doing the same thing. Now, we move on to the pikas, which are still in the rabbit um, order. So the family is called Ochotonidae, but they're very closely related to rabbits and hares and jackrabbits. So here we have our famous pika that lives up in the mountains here. And uh, pikas are, there's only two in all of North America and uh, only one in the lower 48. And this is the American pika. But in the world, there's 37 species of pika. So in other mountainous regions of uh, Europe and Asia, there are many, many species of pikas. You can see that they have short stubby ears, which are necessary because in the very, very cold climates uh, of the winter where they live, their ears would just be frostbitten very uh, fast if they had long ears. You can see this one looks like it's doing some home decorating, but actually it's just gathering the flowers and grasses that it stuffs underneath the rock uh, caverns where it lives so that over the winter, it can have something to eat all winter long. They don't hibernate. So now onto the rodents, this very populous group of uh, mammals that in Colorado, there's 58 species. And we'll start with the squirrels, the Sciuridae family. Some of these are very familiar to you, like the fox squirrel that lives in our towns and cities. And uh, actually this, like the opossum, spread 
uh, west as cities were built. And they didn't used to even live in Colorado. They have just arrived here uh, since we've been building towns and cities across the Great Plains. But one of our uh, longtime native uh, squirrels is the pine squirrel. And you, if you've taken a hike in the mountains, have almost definitely heard this because it chatters at you almost all the time. But um, it, um, it's not uncommon to see them either. And the pine squirrel is found all over the northern part of the uh, continent, including down into the Rocky Mountains where we are. Here's one I uh, met up on uh, the Flatterns up at Royal Arch not too long ago. And I got a picture that shows something remarkable about any small animal, uh, birds or mammals, that are prone to being prey species. You think he can see us from behind? Yep. <laughs> They've got a, um, a 360 degree arc of view so that they can see anything trying to sneak up on it. Hey, Martin. Yes. We do have a question here. Okay. Uh, back to rabbits. Um, yeah. What's the difference between hare and rabbit? Um, well, I'm not going to be able to tell you that right off the bat here, but it's differences in the, the skull and the uh, physiology that make that difference, other aspects of the, the um, skeleton. Um, and genetically, then, you can see much more um, similarity between the hares than the rabbits. So uh, just by just in terms of their very genetic makeup, they are different and it shows up in things like the skull and the physiology. Right. So the pine squirrel, um, you've probably seen these too if you've been in the mountains hiking along these big long-term middens where they might be sitting up in a tree eating um, the spruce cones and uh, eating the seeds and dropping the the wings of the spruce cones down on the ground and they collect over years and years and years. Well, it turns out that they then use those middens to hide their cones that they're not immediately eating. And they call this larder hoarding, <laughs> the great term. Martin, another question. Yes. yes. Uh, why are squirrel tails so long for jumping balance? Yeah, the, the balance is a big thing with any animal that has a long tail and no difference with the squirrel. Um, the, the scientific name Sayuridae actually comes from a word that means uh, a tent tail. <laughs> so they not only have long tails, but um, wide furry tails and they can cover their, their bodies up, not completely, but largely with that tail as well. And that helps uh, keep them from getting too wet sometimes. Uh, here's one of our uh, squirrels that lives up in the usually the foothills, especially in Ponderosa pine forest, the Abert squirrel, or sometimes called the tassel-eared squirrel, and they're pretty quiet. They don't chatter like the the um, uh, pine squirrel, so you're not as likely to see them as you are the pine squirrel. But they're a fairly hefty squirrel, almost the size of the fox squirrel. Now here's a, a squirrel, and it looks like these squirrels that we've just seen, but the ones we've seen so far are the tree squirrels. They're, they're called tree squirrels, and they're very similar to each other in many aspects, including physiology, as I've mentioned. This one looks somewhat like the fox squirrel, but it's in the ground squirrel family. And you can see little differences in the, the appearance but these will actually uh, hibernate, whereas none of the tree squirrels hibernate. And depending on what latitude you are at, um, the rock, rock squirrel can hibernate for as long as six to eight months, although they have been known to wake up on warmer days. But down south into Mexico, they may not hibernate at all. Uh, ground squirrels include this animal, which looks more like a chipmunk and often gets mistaken for one, but this is the golden mantled ground squirrel. And you can see that it doesn't have any stripes on its face. And that's how you tell it apart from all the true chipmunks. And uh, you can see that they store food in their big cheek pouches. And this one's probably stuffed full of various seeds that it's going to take back to its nest. So here's a chipmunk. This is uh, uh, one of the more common chipmunks you'll see, in part just because they are common, and second, because they 
always seem to draw attention to themselves by scurrying out in front of you with their tails held straight up in the air. There are some other chipmunks even close to us here in Boulder County, including one called the Colorado chipmunk and there's the, the Uinta chipmunk, but this one's the one that people most notice. And again, a range map to see how they fit into our state, the West, and then the rest of the continent. Now, of course, anyone who's been in the high country knows this one, the yellow-bellied marmot. And uh, uh, marmots are uh, fairly numerous in North America. This is the only one that occurs in Colorado, the yellow-bellied, but we have six species in North America. And there's only uh, 15 in the whole world. So we have uh, just under half of all the marmots in the world in North America. Now, the marmot is very closely related to the groundhog. So the, the name of the groundhog, uh, actually it's in the same genus, Marmota. And they're both famous for hibernating. So just like we have the tall tale of being able to tell the weather by the um, groundhog that comes out in Pennsylvania, uh, we can uh, kind of tell the weather within wide margins uh, when the marmots start coming out of hibernation. And uh, they can hibernate for as long as eight months per year. Isn't that crazy to think that you only really live uh, four months out of the year? Then we get to the uh, prairie dog. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because this is one that of course there's documentaries produced on and you can find it easily, a lot of information anywhere around here. But I will uh, point out that there's uh, four species of um, prairie dogs in Colorado and this is by far the most numerous, especially on the Eastern Plains. And then point out something that you can look at next time you go out to a prairie dog town. Notice that there's different elevations of the holes and some of that is through natural topography, but if they're on really, really flat land, they will actually build up the entrance to the hole on one side. And that's because the prevailing winds from the west, when they go over uh, the, the higher hole and the lower hole, they set up a natural circulation pattern and that helps keep the um, burrows all ventilated. Then we move on to the uh, pocket gophers. And pocket gophers have these pouches on the side of their mouths uh, where they store food. Some people have thought that they store the dirt that they're big, digging out of the ground and then bring it to the surface. But no, they store food in those pouches. And you can see those big long claws in the front for uh, digging. They're fairly uh, stocky little, strong little animals. And um, they are, there are uh, uh, four species of them in Colorado as well. Here's one that can be found in our area to the west. This is the um, northern pocket gopher. And you might have noticed these kind of uh, castings that are left over from when they burrowed underneath the snow. And move on to yet another of the rodent families, Heteromyidae. And these include the pocket mice and the kangaroo rats. And the, uh, the pocket mice uh, in our state are all um, very small, usually about four inches long, but with a very long tail. And here's the plains pocket mouse that lives to the east of us. And there's other species as well. Oh, and then I don't have a picture of the um, kangaroo rat, but the kangaroo rat is a little bit bigger. And um, by the way, they, they hop around on their back two feet like kangaroos. They hardly use their front feet for uh, getting around at all. And a kangaroo rat, which is about four and a half inches long, can jump nine feet. And I figured out the equivalent for say a six foot human being able to jump. If you were able to jump that far, a six foot human could jump 180 feet. How do you like that? Martin? Yes. I'll interrupt you for a question. Yeah. Uh, it's going back to squirrels. Sorry, yep. I had to delay. No problem. <laughs> so how long do squirrels live? And how many calories do squirrels need each day? Oof, calories per day. I'll have to skip on that one. <laughs> right. That's a tough um, one. Uh, you know, uh, if we need somewhere in the neighborhood of, what, a, a thousand minimum and more likely 1,500, 2,000, uh, you not only divide by the, the size of your body, but you add on a little bit for every step down. So in other words, 
even though they're much smaller than us, relative to their body size, they have to eat more. And that's why the shrew has to eat almost twice its weight. Uh, where, the, where the squirrels fit in, I'm not quite sure, but a lot more per unit of weight than we do. Um, and, and how long do they live? Yeah, how long do they live? In the wild, most of these rodents are only going to live, uh, well, the larger ones, maybe two or three years. Um, no, I'm sorry, the marmots can live longer than that, 10 or 15. But in the wild, uh, some of the smaller m uh, mice and rodents that we're going to see here only live one year. Squirrels, I would guess somewhere in the neighborhood of two to three years, a uh, normal lifespan. In captivity, they can live longer. Okay, so now we're on to this other family, Muridae, which includes most of the familiar mice and rats. So uh, the deer mouse is um, uh, the most common mammal in all of Colorado. Uh, they're, they're everywhere and in large numbers, and you've probably seen them near your house even. Maybe not in your house necessarily, because they're not like as well uh, adapted to human beings as the house mouse, which is a non-native species but um, they nonetheless can live in our houses. And then there's the wood rats, uh, which unlike rats have, uh, many of them anyway, have furry tails or slightly furry tails. And there's one called the bushy tailed wood rat that uh, lives in Colorado. And they're the famous pack rats that will gather all manner of uh, items, including man-made items to put in their, their uh, nests. Now, here's one that you may not have heard of at all. We're going to spend a little time on it because it's a, a most unusual little mouse. It looks somewhat like the uh, deer mouse, but I call it the mouse with a glint in its eye. <laughs> and that's because this mouse is carnivorous. And not only that, has some amazing adaptation. Um, an interesting uh, end note to this uh, species is that way back in the early 1900s, when there were already biologists roaming all over our continent studying various critters, uh, naturalist Vernon Bailey described the call of the grasshopper mouse as a wolf's howl in miniature. And now with these great videos, we're able to see some of these amazing mammals in our midst uh, uh, close up. Now the muskrat is also a member of the same family, and yet it's quite a bit bigger than any of the others. And its distinguishing features include its flattened tail, it's flattened top to bottom, and so it uses it in a kind of a whip-like fashion to swim through the water. And they do live in the water and uh, eat water plants, etc. And then of course the porcupine, which is in its uh, own family and uh, it's very unusual in that the, the uh, hairs are uh, modified into quills in many parts of its body. And therefore, they don't really need to worry about running away from anything. And they're very, very, very slow. And they just lumber through trees, uh, eating the inner bark for the most part. Uh, they're found all over the state, but they're uh, in just in suitable habitat where there's uh, plenty of trees to eat the bark of. and. Uh, not near human settlement for the most part. So in Boulder County, they've become uh, very rare. Hey, Martin. Yes. Before we uh, move too far away from mouse and rat, we have another question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, what defines a mouse versus rat? Perhaps their size? Yeah, for the most part, it's just, uh, in this case, uh, just our own human names of uh, common names. Uh, the larger uh, creatures like the pack rats and the Norway rat, which we didn't show, but of course another non-native rat, et cetera, are larger than what we call mice. Thank you. Okay, then the jumping mice, the uh, dip Dipotidae, and we have a species of meadow jumping mouse in our uh, uh, area, but this one's endangered, and in fact it's called the Prebles jumping mouse, and it lives along creeks in uh, coyote willow areas. That's its habitat. <clears throat> now, although we've never uh, been verified in Lafayette or even Louisville, there's a chance that they could be there because they're found in the Coal Creek drainage and other uh, creeks that flow through our region. Uh, right now, they're mostly verified closer up to the foothills. Then we're on to uh, the beaver, and I'm going to uh, go into a couple things about this animal that are about its behavior. And then right after that, uh, we'll open it up 
to see if there's any questions via not only chat, but if anyone wants to uh, unmute and, and have a live question, we can do that too. So the beavers in the family Castoridae, and uh, they're familiar to most people, even if you've never ne necessarily seen one, but they're not hard to find if you go to their, their habitat on streams that they've dammed up. And they're found over almost all of North America, except for the real drier parts of the Southwest. And um, in Colorado, they're found statewide in suitable habitat. And so most of you have seen a beaver dam and maybe beaver lodges. Um, and off to the right of this lodge is a pile of sticks where during the winter in real cold areas where the pond is going to freeze over, they will make a winter food cache, an area that they can swim out from their underwater entrance and then grab a stick to um, bring into their den and eat the inner bark off of. And that shows uh, not only the engineering prowess that they have, but also what you might think of as planning. They're, they're planning ahead. And this is the uh, behavioral aspect I want to have a little diversion on just a second. Do they really plan ahead in a in a conscious way. In other words, oh, let's see, winter's coming, we better do X, Y, and Z and think about it consciously. Or do they do it by instinct, meaning that they do this behavior in an instinctive, not conscious way? Well, probably the latter, because um, beavers don't put up um, food for, say, two winters in a row, or then get into putting up food for long, long periods of time. It's just one season ahead, one winter ahead. And this has always been fascinating to me. And uh, it has to do with the idea of what is conscious awareness and what is abstraction, the kinds of things that we humans definitely have. But one time I had the opportunity to talk with Jane Goodall for some extended period of time. And my biggest uh, curiosity stemmed around the awareness of these creatures, the time awareness, and their awareness of their own self. And she confirmed with me that they're very aware of their own self, know themselves as distinguished from others. And in fact, they can, they can pick out a picture of themselves out of a stack of pictures of chimpanzees or a gorilla if we're talking about them. And she said they do have some sense of time in the future. And she says that we know that they're aware of like the idea of tomorrow. And that's because they can often be seen as they're bedding down, kind of getting ready for the next day, so to speak. Sometimes they might put medicinal herbs nearby if they're not feeling well. And in the morning, the first thing they go to is those herbs. Well, I then asked her if they're aware of death and I, I kind of knew the answer to that. Uh, yes, and many creatures do. But when I asked her, do you think they're aware of their own impending deaths? And without any delay, she answered, no, I don't think so. And whereas that's not absolute proof for someone who spent a good part of her life with these animals, it probably is a good indication that they can't quite abstract to that level. And when we look back on our own anthropology, Anthropologists usually say that the abstract um, abilities like art and um, time and religion, things like that, probably all arose in a very, very short time, geologically speaking, when our mental machinery had suddenly become able to abstract in that manner. So a little diversion from our Colorado mammals, but whenever I see a beaver dam or lodge I think about their, their living out there on their instincts, probably mostly through the winters of Colorado. Okay, now we're on to the artiodactyls, which are the even-toed ungulates. And uh, they uh, include the deer, of course, the deer family, the family Cervidae. And in Colorado, the most famous ones are the mountain deer, the mule deer. But in many parts of the state, especially in the eastern plains along the river bottoms, we have the uh, white-tailed deer. And um, I wonder if you've seen the uh, patterns of the antlers that gives away which deer this is. The mule deer has this pattern on the left and the white-tail that on the right. Can you figure out which one we have here? 
Well, if you look at the prongs of the uh, mule deer, there's uh, branches off of their branches instead of just one main trunk with tines coming off of it. So you can see the circled uh, double branches there indicate that this is a mule deer. An elk is in this family, uh, much bigger than either of the deer, and you're probably very familiar with them, and they're the featured animal in the Rocky Mountain National Park, so we won't go too much into this, other than to say that all these antlered animals grow their antler with the um, the furry velvet that uh, starts growing when they're, or that's how they grow is by bringing blood and calcium and phosphate minerals uh, to the uh, uh, growing antler. And at the end of the season, they have to rub off all that velvet when it kind of dries up and they'll rub them on trees and so forth. But one day I saw one of these elk finishing off the last of its velvet by rubbing it through the grasses and it looked like it was wearing this little hat. <laughs> Then we get to the pronghorn, and the pronghorn is a very unusual animal. It's called pronghorn antelope often, but it's not an antelope at all. And uh, I'm going to show a video in just a second to, to uh, talk about its speed, but you can see it has horns, not antlers. And they're found in much of the western United States, at least this is their um, former range, and they're found in parts of all of that. And as I mentioned, they're not an antelope, they're in their own family. And of all the mammals out there, they're most uh, closely related to giraffes and okapi. Their horns are um, not made of bone. Horns are made out of tightly woven hair, but very unique for the pronghorn is that they actually shed these horns annually, whereas almost all other, if not all other horned animals keep their horns and keep growing them throughout their life. And the pronghorn is the fastest land animal in the Western Hemisphere. It can run 35 miles an hour for four miles and at 55 plus miles per hour for a half a mile. Moving uh, along quickly to the Bovidae. And uh, again, the bighorn sheep is our state mammal and uh, it's the mascot of the school I went to, but I'm not gonna say anything about it. <laughs> we don't have the time. And it's one of the uh, mammals that of course we learn about all the time and it's easy to find out. So uh, look more into that. And the bison the same way, it's you know, one of the, um, you know, the archetypal mammals of the West. So we're going to finish up with the carnivores. And um, with the, the dog family, uh, most people are familiar with, even if you haven't seen a red fox. But around here, especially up in the mountains, I've seen many red foxes that are almost entirely black. And uh, the way you can tell it's a red fox is the white tip of the tail. So whether it's reddish or blackish or anything in between, the red fox around here always has a white tip of the tail. And they're very adapted to living out in the wilds or in our cities. Then the gray fox is a lot less common, especially in Colorado than the red fox, but they are found here. And they're often called the uh, tree fox because they can actually climb into the lower branches of trees. Then two much lesser known foxes, the uh, swift fox, which is out in the eastern plains starting from here and up and down the Great Plains. And uh, then the ket fox, which is to our west in southwestern Colorado. Some scientists actually consider these to be one species, but um, most consider them to be distinct because they're in very different habitats. They rarely uh, mix and they have different adaptations. <clears throat> Then we're all familiar with the coyotes around here and seems like I hear something about coyotes almost daily. So we'll just uh, remind ourselves that they're one of our wild dogs in our midst. And then to the weasels. And I mentioned that uh, I did my master's thesis on mink and I have some interesting pictures of mink in a sec. But before that, the pine marten uh, that lives in the mountains and uh, amazingly, they hunt squirrels in the trees. And can you imagine the speed and agility that a uh, pine marten needs to be able to chase down a squirrel in a tree? They're, they're um, medium-sized weasels about maybe a foot and a half long. Then here's the mink. And right before we did the uh, February session on mammals, uh, there was a woman who contacted me who had a friend, uh, we credit him here, Max Bello, who came from Chile 
and he's a, a, a conservationist there and he took some great pictures of mink down on Boulder Creek. So here's a close up of one. And here's another one with an enormous fish. I'm guessing this is a sucker actually. And that, that's definitely on the large uh, size of the uh, uh, scale of things that it'll eat. But the mink is actually found throughout most of North America. And the reason is that they're so adaptable. They'll eat mostly, uh, almost entirely animals, but of any different kind. They'll eat frogs and fish and crayfish and worms and snakes and you name it, uh, they're voracious predators. And I do have some video here that I wanna show you a part of because it's really unique. It's taken in Wisconsin and set to music, but I think it's deserving. It's just, let's watch the beauty of this uh, animal in the wild. I'm gonna skip around just a little bit. questions real oh quick. yes uh -huh. can we do those yep i don't want to get too far behind with the questions um yep. this is from natalie flowers what time of year do the pronghorn shed their sheets is it in the winter time like other deer or elk uh are there bone growths underneath like the okapi yeah um the season you know what i'd have to go and check on that too i'm guessing it is in the in the late fall but um, let, let me uh, find that out and verify it. But yes, they have bony sheaths underneath and they definitely look uh, very odd with just those, uh, or bony um, cores, I should say. So look really odd with those bony cores underneath. Mm -hmm. And then do we have fishers in Colorado? If so, what's the difference between Martins and fishers? Yeah, um, fishers are not found in Colorado. They're uh, in Canada and the Northeastern United States. Uh, they're a little bigger than uh, Martins and quite a bit uh, rarer. They're endangered in many of the parts of uh, the country, the uh, North America where they do live. And then another question, this, act this act question actually comes from me. Mm -hmm. On the pronghorns, I've heard that they have larger hearts than other mammals of their size or, or for their own body weight. And the reason for the large heart is to uh, sustain that sprint is that true oh yeah yeah so a large heart and great pulmonary system and what they mentioned for the cheetah the large nostrils um, all are necessary to get that oxygen to their muscles on a very rapid basis excellent one yeah. more question okay oh maybe two <laughs> have a lot of u.s mink been affected by covid like in other places hmm. um that's a pending question for me. I, I keep seeing things about mink being affected, but of course, especially in Europe where we heard some of that news, that's in the mink farms, where of course you're in a, just an epidemic uh, uh, hotspot because of the proximity of all the creatures. In the wild, I don't know whether in Europe or in North America, whether um, you know, there's any appreciable uh, infection in wild mink. Good. All well, great questions we have to look into. All right, moving on in some of the weasels here, we have the long-tailed weasel, which uh, is found all over the state, but in the mountains, uh, they do change color like the snowshoe hare, whereas down here, they don't. And uh, so that's an interesting uh, variability within one species. And uh, they're not uncommon, uh, but you know, not, not commonly seen. And even less common than the long-tailed weasel is, uh, oops, did I? No, I guess I didn't skip over. I thought I had a picture of the ermine, uh, the short-tailed weasel, but I may have left that out. And the river otter is also a weasel and they are 
uh, found in, in Boulder County now, and they've been uh, reintroduced in diff different parts of the state. Now, the skunks used to be, until recently, classified as in the weasel family, but now they're separated out based on genetics uh, into their own family, Mephitidae. And we, of course, have the striped skunk that uh, almost everyone is familiar with. But on the very last slide, where I'll show some of the uh, some of the leftover mammals we can't get to, you'll see the spotted skunk, which is also found in Colorado, both Western and Eastern. Then the raccoons and allies. Well, what does allies mean? Well, we'll start with the raccoon because everyone knows that one. Um, and they're, they're just so adaptable to both living in wild places, but in neighborhoods and cities. Uh, and so we're pretty familiar with them. But have you ever even heard of, let alone seen, a ring-tailed cat? They're not really cats. They're related to raccoons. And they do live in Colorado. You can see the map there and kind of extend up uh, into the foothill areas of Boulder County. But after we did the last uh, talk here, the, the February mammal session, I got an email from someone that uh, lives in Heatherwood, or at least they have a neighbor that lives in Heatherwood. And they sent us this wildlife cam picture. And so this is quite a ways out into the, the plains. There's still some topography there. There's some rock formations and such that makes me think that they can extend out in the plains in uh, suitable habitat. But boy, does that ring tail show up. And just like the raccoon, they're very adaptable in terms of eating. Uh, they're not as adaptable to human beings for the most part, but they'll eat a wide range of things ranging from seeds and berries and fruits to all sorts of different animals. All right, the cats. Um, we'll, we'll bound through these fairly quickly. But just to know that bobcats have been seen down along um, uh, Coal Creek in both Louisville and Lafayette, and so have mink, by the way. Uh, but of course, we won't ever see a lynx down here because they're only in the mountains and were recently reintroduced to Colorado. And you can see those just almost outlandishly large feet that they use for walking and running over the snow to chase their favorite prey item, which is the snowshoe hare. And then we get to the mountain lion, which we started with. And um, this, again, is one of the famous animals that you'll hear a lot about here and there. But I'll just note that they're found in North and South America. Uh, the orange ranges, by the way, are where they used to be. And they are repopulating some of those orange ranges. But uh, look at the skull of this animal and see you know, the, uh, how it's built for, for carnivory with those huge uh, canines, and then lots and lots of surface area for the attachment of the muscles that are allow for the really powerful bite, etc. I want to share with you a very short video here, captured by the neighbor of a friend of mine uh, up in the foothills just west of Loveland. And you'll see that there's two mountain lions in the uh, frame here, but watch what happens. There's a second cub, and then a third. <laughs> so the usual litter size of mountain lions is one, sometimes two, but they are not, uh, it's not unheard of to um, see three. Okay, and then we're gonna end up with the bears. Um, they, it's just the order in which uh, taxonomists place bears at the end of the carnivores. And of course we have the black bear in Colorado. No grizzlies anymore. They went extinct here a long time ago. That means extirpated is the word for that. And uh, black bears can come in quite a range of coat uh, colors. So even though they may be cinnamon or brown or sometimes even white, uh, the, they're, they may all be black bears. And uh, they're very adaptable too in terms of their diet. And they eat anything from seeds and berries and fruit to insects to other animals. And I just wanted to share these pictures with you that aren't from Colorado, but they're from Tennessee. And I got a picture of the mom eating uh, service berries off of a, br a bush on the ground. And then uh, one of her cubs was up in the tree eating the uh, buds off of Virginia creeper. So uh, quite adaptable. Okay, well, here's the roundup uh, picture with a lot of other mammals, but they still don't cover all the mammals in Colorado. 
Did you know that armadillos have been sighted in southeastern Colorado? Uh, the uh, mountain goat is in central Colorado. There's badgers, which is a kind of a, a weasel, 13 line ground squirrels, the spotted skunk, the kangaroo rat, the wolverine, of which one has been known to have at least passed through Colorado, the moose, and then of course the wolf. So we'll, we'll end there.